I'm Sydney Butler. I'm Helen Strickland. I'm Madeline Young. I'm Hannah Demars. And we're going to talk to you guys about facility dogs. So raise your hand if you have a dog. Okay, now raise your hand if you've ever been in a courthouse. Okay, so did you ever think that you could be related? 70% of our participants didn't, and neither did we until Dr. McQuiston came into our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a little background. So there are two uses for dogs other than your common household pet. There are service dogs and facility, er, therapy dogs. <laughs> service dogs are trained to perform tasks and services that are directly related to an individual's disability, such as a seeing eye dog. Therapy dogs are used in therapeutic settings to work with patients, such as individuals with autism, PTSD, and depression during their therapy. Therapy dogs have also been used in school reading programs to give children the chance to read aloud to a therapy dog in an attempt to improve reading skills and increase confidence in those reading skills. The positive effects of dog seeing here has sparked the growing use of facility dogs within our judicial system. Dogs used in the judicial, judicial system are referred to as facility dogs and they are used throughout legal proceedings such as in investigations, pretrial interviews, and in the courtroom. Facility dogs and their handlers, usually attorneys, receive extensive training before the dog is allowed in the courtroom. Our study focuses specifically on the use of facility dogs during testimony to comfort testifying witnesses. There are currently 131 dogs in 34 states being used. Two of these dogs are in South Carolina. There's one in Anderson and one in Charleston. This is a picture of Roma, the facility dog in Anderson, South Carolina, whose handler is actually a Wofford grad. So who needs the assistance of facility dogs during trial? There are, there are some witnesses are um, highly susceptible to re-traumatization as a result of having to testify in front of the accused. These witnesses are referred to as vulnerable witnesses and can, can include children, individuals with mental disabilities, and victims of violent crimes. Vulnerable witnesses are often allowed a comfort item to have with them during court to help facilitate conversation between the witness and the attorneys during direct and cross examinations. Examples of facility dogs used in the past include dolls, teddy bears, and even a comfort person. Dogs have recently been used as um, to comfort vulnerable witnesses as their presence has been shown to decrease anxiety and increase disclosure rates. So the state who prosecutes the case insists that facility dogs are great for witnesses because they reduce anxiety, increase disclosure rates, and reduce the likelihood of re-traumatization. The defense, on the other hand, has argued vigorously against the use of these dogs in the courtroom. They believe that facility dogs unfairly bias the jurors against their defendant and um, make the, um, the victim or the witness seem more credible and um, they have more favorable views of the witness. Um, in cases in which facility dogs have been used, um, in the ones that the defendant has been convicted, the case has been brought up on appeal uh, based on the use of the facility dogs. However, judges have denied these appeals, saying that the dog does not unfairly bias jurors towards the defendant or against the defendant. Um, so historically, these judges have been basing these decisions solely on, solely on intuition and not on any scientific findings. This is um, inspired McQuiston, um, Bird, and Haney to begin examining how dogs in um, courtroom affect jurors and whether in fact judges have been ruling correctly that jurors are not influenced by the dog's presence. Um, so in McQuiston, Bird, and Haney's study, they presented the mock jurors with a case involving a young girl who claimed that her grandfather molested her. In one of these conditions, she was um, shown with a comfort item, and in the other, she was um, accompanied by a facility dog. Overall, there was no effect of the, of the facility dog on the judgments against the child, the, um, the defendant, or the case, but these could be due to the nature of the case itself. It's, um, with the young girl accusing a family member of assaulting her, this could have increased or um, elicited such a strong emotional response from the mock jurors that there really wasn't enough room to see if the dog itself had any effect on their judgments in the case. So 
use of um, other research using different types of cases is, was warranted. So the emotional reaction elicited by the previous research by Dr. McQuiston may have overshadowed some of the other things going on in the courtroom, specifically the dog. We know that jurors sometimes um, have trouble um, looking at other things in the courtroom. For instance, um, things that affect them aside from evidence can be religion, race, um, gender, age, and socioeconomic status of the victim or the defendant. Specifically in sexual assault and molestation cases, there can be a stigma held against individuals who <coughs> come forward claiming sexual assault, specifically males. And for women, research shows that sometimes women are blamed for their role in their sexual assault. So it is important that research examining the way that the legal system looks at these witnesses or these victims takes into account these separate variables. So for our research, the purpose was to examine how a facility dog affected jurors on um, how, how they affected juror decisions. Um, as a function of victim gender and a case for molestation of a teenager. Our design was a two by two between participants design. One independent variable was our facility dog and the other was the victim's gender. For this study we had three hypotheses. The first was that the facility dog would elicit more favorable views to the victim, towards the victim and more biased views towards the defendant. Um, the second, because of societal stigmas and taboo, um, we felt that uh, men often struggle to come forward uh, claiming sexual assault. So we hypothesized that mock jurors would feel more sympathy for the male victim and therefore find his story a little more credible. For the third hypothesis, we hypothesized that when the victim is male, the dog's presence will elicit more favorable views of him than when he does not have a dog. And when the victim is female, there would be little to no effect of the presence of the dog. Our study included 155 participants from Walker College. 72% of our participants were female, and the average age was around 20 years old. Um, 80, the majority of our participants were white. Our participants read a study including involving a, either a male or female 14-year-old who claimed to have been repeatedly touched inappropriately at camp by the camp director. The defendant denies these charges. During the victim's testimony, there either was or was not a facility dog present to comfort the victim. Our materials included a summary of the facts of the case and the allegations and a partial transcript, including the judge's instructions, the attorney's opening and closing arguments, and a direct examination of the victim. Along with this information, we also included several photographs of the victim on this trial, either with or without the facility dog present. Here are some of the pictures we have. Participants completed a questionnaire that um, included information about the defendant, the case, and the victim. Our dependent measures questions included things such as the believability of the defendant, as well as the strength of the case, and whether or not participants found the defendant guilty. When participants found the defendant guilty, we then asked the length of sentencing. We asked manipulation check questions to determine the level of attention participants paid to the case, as well as demographic questions. So to examine the results of our study, we conducted a series of two by two to note. We found three significant main effects of the facility dog variable. However, we found no main effects of the victim gender. We also had one significant interaction. First, when participants were asked how believable the defendant's explanation of the event was, participants found the defendant's story significantly less believable when there was a dog present in the courtroom versus when there was no dog present. When participants were asked how sympathetic they felt towards the victim, the participants were significantly less sympathetic towards the victim when there was a dog present versus when there was no dog present. Similarly, when the participants were asked how empathetic they felt towards the victim, the participants were less empathetic towards the victim when there was a dog present in the courtroom versus when there was no dog present. Here lies our significant interaction. The difference in empathy ratings when the dog is present versus when the dog is not present is due to the female victim. She is driving the significant interaction. That is, when the victim was male, empathy ratings did not differ as a function of the presence of the dog. However, when the victim was female, 
the presence of the dog resulted in less empathy towards her versus when there was no dog present. So the main concern for this research was to determine if the presence of the facility dog had an effect on jurors' judgments, more specifically the potential of the dog to bias jurors against the defendant. We found no evidence of this. Our findings did suggest, however, that the presence of the facility dog resulted in negative evaluations of the, both the defendant and the victim. However, these negative evaluations did not influence jurors' judgments of verdict and sentencing. An interesting finding was that the female victim, accompanied by the facility dog, was viewed with the least amount of empathy. This is not what we predicted, but it is consistent with literature saying that people often hold a bias towards female sexual assault victims. These results align with the growing body of research in this area and further support the continued use of facility dogs in the courthouse. Judges can now begin to base their decision making of whether or not to allow, to allow a facility dog in the courtroom on empirical evidence. So there are a few um, interesting next steps for this research. The International Courthouse Dogs Foundation would like to see us research how domestic violence <coughs> victims accompanied by facility dogs are um, perceived by mock jurors or mock jurors. Also, a general population sample is necessary so that we get a wider range of opinions and judgments. Um, so we'd like to compare to the um, ones we've from college students. <coughs> and we would also like to interview jurors um, post-trial um, and survey them to see how the presence of a facility dog in the courtroom actually affected their decisions. And their Before we close, we would like to acknowledge these people, specifically our advisor, Dr. Don McQuiston, and all others who helped us with the materials and conducting of our study. And are there any questions? Any questions for this group? So, um, it, was, it was interesting that the bias changed for the females, but only with the dog. So you guys said um, that people might have more of a bias to judge women more negatively, or, or girls, I guess, overall. Um, but why especially whenever they had a dog with them? We thought that one of the things, um, well, when we were conducting our experiment with people, people were coming up to us afterwards and saying, like, oh, the, the girl looks shifty. I mean, it, I don't know if you saw in our pictures. Like, well, we use the same pictures for each group, and sometimes pictures, some people said, oh, she looked like she was crying. Some people said, oh, she looked like she was happy. And so we think that some of those personal biases and then looking at the dog might have said, might have made people feel like um, she was trying to elicit more sympathy from the people because they already had that initial bias, you know, from our study um, that we looked at from Bert. People said she found that people had biases already against women who claim sexual assault, and so maybe that that bias carried on to how they saw the girl trying to elicit more feelings using the dog. Go ahead. Um, did y'all run any analysis with like having all <coughs> male and female participants in one group of like dog with their dog, like just to see if that was like statistically significant? Yeah, we found that there, were no, there was no statistical significance between the dog with gender. Any more questions? Go ahead. Or how are you going to disseminate this information to judges? That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question. I presented these findings to the Courthouse Dog Foundation, uh, and there were judges in the room and a lot of attorneys in the room, so that's one way to do it. Um, so I think it works through attorneys first. I think that's, that really is how this goes. And this is in its infancy, of course. There have been very few, very few studies. But that certainly is the ultimate goal, since the judge is the gatekeeper of evidence um, in the room, in the courtroom. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you. Thank you.